Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh <clears throat> and welcome to this episode and today we just finished the fifth day of Ramadan which means that if you have been reading one juz of the Quran one portion of the Quran uh, you should be at the sixth uh, juz you should be <clears throat> basically at Surat Al-Ma'idah Surat Al-Ma'idah is the fifth chapter of the Quran and it has a huge significance in the history of the Islamic uh, nation and of the Muslim community. Uh, the It's important to note that uh, there are, uh, before Surat Al-Ma'idah, there are four other chapters. The first one is Surat Al-Fatiha. This is the opening uh, chapter, which is only seven verses. After that comes the longest chapter in the Quran, which is Surat Al-Baqarah. Um, and then after that comes Surat Al-Imran, which is the third longest uh, chapter in the Quran. And then after that comes Surat Al-Nisa, the woman, and that is the second uh, longest chapter in the Quran. And after that comes Al-Ma'idah, uh, which actually is the last big chapter to be revealed uh, for, the, uh, for the Muslims. So the Surat Al-Baqarah, it speaks about the time uh, before uh, before Badr. So this speaks about the time in Medina <clears throat> very early on uh, when the Muslims emigrated to Medina uh, with the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him just establishing the Muslim community and the Muslim presence and the Muslim nation uh, in that city after they have been driven away uh, from Mecca. And then uh, Surat uh, Al-Imran it starts talking about Ghazwat Badr. Uh, which is the kind of the first battle that uh, that happened with the Muslims, the first major battle that happened with the Muslims. And that was uh, during this, the third year after the immigration to uh, to Medina. And then as we pass through the uh, uh, this juz, um, and then we start going into uh, the chapter of An-Nisa, the chapter of the woman, this actually speaks about the situation after the second major battle of the Muslims, in which Muslims um, were, uh, you could say, announced defeated um, because of a mistake that they have done. Um, and this mistake uh, is described uh, in Surat uh, Al-Imran as we, um, as well as the repercussions of it are uh, described in Surat Al-Nisa, the, the woman. And Surat Al-Nisa is a pretty large chapter, but it is filled with law, uh, with basically jurisprudence that, that is related to the events that happened in Ghazwat Uhud, in the Battle of Uhud. And... Uh, some of these are basically because a lot of people died in the Battle of Uhud. What happened was that uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, put 50 archers on Mount Uhud and he told them, do not move. Like, you remain there. It doesn't matter if we were being uh, wiped out or if we're winning. Just don't leave that place. So what ended up happening is that when the Muslims started to win the battle and they won it pretty quickly, um, a big portion of those archers, it is said uh, 40 of them, uh, they left their positions and went down. Um, and the rest were calling them. They said, do not go. The Prophet said, do not go. So when they went down, Khalid ibn al-Walid, who is a, actually a major general uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, um, as well as one of the uh, biggest war strategists um, and fighting strategists uh, that is known in that era, uh, he was with the Quraysh. He was with the Meccan people. So what he did is that he uh, stood there with his, uh, with his platoon and he didn't move. He did not participate in the battle until... Uh, he saw those archers come down, then he went around the mountain and he struck the Muslims from back, from the back. And then after he struck them from the back, uh, the uh, the Meccan people, they started to push from the forward and they basically sandwiched the Muslims there. Um, and they sandwiched the Muslims pretty badly. Um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, almost was killed. Many people were killed in that, uh, in that battle and hence there were many widows, there were many orphaned children. Um, there were many issues that, uh, social issues that started to arise. So the chapter of the woman, Anisa, it came about uh, because it was discussing a lot of the gender-based uh, issues uh, for both men and women, things that are related to, uh, to second marriages, things that are related to um, the widow marriages, uh, basically marrying from a widow, things that are related to what happens after a, or if, if, if the woman is widowed, um, how long does she wait? Uh, what about if, if she gets divorced? How, how long does she wait before she gets married to um, after that? It speaks about inheritance. Now, you know, many, many men died and men used to be the breadwinners in society back then. So how does this money get, dist get distributed between, uh, between the people, between the families, uh, between the relatives? All this stuff was mentioned in Surah An-Nisa. Then um, after that um, comes the chapter of Al-Ma'idah. 
Um, and Al-Ma'idah is actually, despite it being the fifth chapter in the order of the Qur'an, it actually was revealed very, very later on in the Islamic history, at the t in the time of the uh, Muslim uh, nation. As a matter of fact, it was revealed when the political situation was the complete opposite of what it was after the Battle of Uhud, after the um, third battle, the third uh, or the second major battle that uh, the Muslims <clears throat> were announced or can be uh, thought of as uh, as defeated and it actually was revealed in the 10th year after the immigration to uh, Medina and this 10th year was when the Muslims ended up conquering Mecca they ended up taking over uh, the rulership of Mecca which is the holy city uh, that the Prophet peace be upon him is from as well as many of the uh, migrants were uh, were from originally before they went uh, to Medina and at that time basically the Muslims were at the highest level of power that they have ever been, been since the beginning of this message with the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and hence this power was um, was different they have never experienced this before and hence this chapter this chapter of Al-Ma'idah came as of as almost uh, the final bow tie on uh, on the uh, Muslim nation and on on the Islamic law. Basically, this uh, this chapter has a lot of jurisprudence, a lot of law, uh, but also it has a lot of reminders to the Muslims that hey, now you're in power, but that doesn't mean that uh, all these ethos that you have been adhering to, which your enemies haven't been adhering to since the beginning, it doesn't mean that you throw it away. Because right now, as we know, uh, in, in modern world as well as in uh, in prehistoric world. Um, basically the powerful, they don't have to follow any ethics. They they set the ethics. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Muslims that yes, now you are the most powerful nation that exists in the region, uh, in that area, but that doesn't mean that you uh, let go of your ethics. As a matter of fact, what this means, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states it, you have to hold a higher level of ethics uh, because now you are uh, more powerful. So this is uh, this is very interesting. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them as well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you what he promised. He has given you the victory. Um, and that is because you have obeyed the Prophet, peace be upon him. Um, and when you didn't obey the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, that is in Uhud, uh, you have lost. And this one, this is actually a reminder to continue to, to obey the Prophet, peace be upon him, and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and his commandments. In this chapter also, there are a lot of verses that pertain to how to deal with uh, the people from the uh, Christian faiths. Um, and the reason for that is that at, at this time, the Muslims have become the power in the region and they started to reach out to other nations. They started to reach out uh, to the Romans. They started to reach out to the Persians. But mainly uh, their interaction with the Romans and the Christians has increased and has basically multiplied many times over. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides guidance, provides uh, rules and provides um, information and provides historic uh, facts uh, to the Muslims that they can use uh, when uh, in their engagement with the uh, with the Christian people as well as it provides them with law of what is allowed to eat um, from the uh, from uh, from the Christian nations uh, what type of meat is allowed to eat uh, from the Christian nations um, as well as uh, what type of uh, other engagements that they're allowed to uh, the Muslims are allowed to uh, be part of with the Christians and the Jews for example um, how does the marriage across the um, across the, between the Muslims and the Christians happen? Um, the, uh, the 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 Muslims uh, the Muslim men can marry the uh, the Christian woman, for example, uh, but there are certain rules uh, that needs to be fulfilled uh, in order to for that marriage to be uh, to be allowed. So all these things are mentioned in this uh, in this chapter, as well as um, there are uh, the story of uh, of Qabil wa Habil, the sons of Adam, Cain and Abel. Um, so Cain and, uh, and Abel, they, uh, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions their story actually extensively uh, in this chapter. What happened between them? Why did one of them kill the other? W what happened with that, uh, with that sense of jealousy? What happened with that sense of power? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions after that the verses that pertain to killing uh, a Muslim. Um, and what happens if, if somebody kills, uh, kills a Muslim or if somebody kills somebody uh, who is from another nation that uh, is uh, not in war with uh, with the Muslims. So if somebody goes and, and kills somebody um, by mistake, obviously, uh, from another nation that is in um, that is in relation uh, or in good terms or in uh, alliance with the Muslims, uh, what happens then? How how is that um, how is that expiate, expiate, expiated? 
Um, and what if somebody kills a Muslim by mistake? A Muslim kills a Muslim by mistake. What happens then? And then what if a Muslim kills another Muslim on purpose? It wasn't a mistake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمُ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَلَعَنَهُ وَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا That if somebody kills a Muslim on purpose and it wasn't a mistake, then let them know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wrath Will be upon these people, uh, upon this person that that purposely killed this, um, you know, his his brother, um, and that he will end up being in hellfire, and he will have a great uh, punishment from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Basically, stating and saying, look, O Muslims, yes, now you're in power, but don't let this power corrupt you, because if this power starts corrupting you, you're going to be just like Cain and Abel. You're going to start to have jealousy. These political issues are going to start arising. And on top of that, uh, you will start killing each other. It also states explicitly uh, in this chapter how it is important uh, to uh, for, for the coexistence, for uh, having that civic society uh, between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. And the way the chapter is actually structured, it tells you that Muslims were living with the Jews and the Christians and other uh, other nations in harmony. Uh, they were not in um, they were not in uh, in this inner conflict. There was no inner conflict. There was a civic society that existed uh, based on the um, uh, on the law that uh, and based on the. Uh, on the treaties that existed at um, at that time and the understandings and the social contracts that were there, which means that um, these social contracts, they need to be upheld. Now the Muslims are in power, are, are the most powerful nation in the region. That doesn't mean that you let go of, uh, of these things. As a matter of fact, um, you have to, um, uh, you know, hold higher standards uh, when you deal with uh, the people that uh, you're dealing uh, with. Um, so these are some of the uh, things that were mentioned uh, in this chapter. Uh, the chapter is very extensive. Uh, the chapter is about 22 pages long and um, and it's just beautiful, just flows. Uh, but there's so much law in there, so much law. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually men mentions a portion uh, in the uh, in, in the verse at the beginning of the chapter where he says that today I have completed um, that today I have uh, perfected uh, your faith for you and I have completed my bounties upon you and I have uh, accepted Islam as a way of life uh, for you. Um, and this actually a verse that uh, when one of the uh, rabbis, the, the Jewish rabbis um, uh, was reading about, he went to uh, one time to uh, Umar al-Khattab. Umar al-Khattab was uh, the companion of the Prophet peace be upon him and he became the second caliph after the Prophet peace be upon him. And he told him, do you know Umar, there's a verse that is in your book that um, if it was revealed to us as Jews, we would actually hold that day as a day of celebration, as a day of Eid, as a day of, as a holy day. And Umar al-Khattab told him, what is this verse? He said this verse, that basically I have perfected uh, the religion for you. This is an important verse that uh, is in your book. And he said, uh, Umar al-Khattab said, I swear that we know exactly when that verse was revealed and the day that was revealed in and what the Prophet peace be upon him was doing. Basically this verse was revealed during Hajjat al-Wada, the final pilgrimage that the Prophet peace be upon him uh, performed before he passed uh, away and it was actually on the day of Friday um, so and the Prophet peace be upon him was standing and he was uh, delivering a khutbah he was delivering a sermon and this verse uh, was revealed to him so Friday is considered a holiday is considered a Eid for the Muslims so Umar al-Khattab was telling him, we know exactly when this verse uh, was uh, was revealed. And uh, Friday was it was not considered a Eid or a holiday because of this verse. It is considered a Eid because it is considered a Eid. Um, it is a, a time of gathering for the Muslims and it's a time of celebration. and It's a time of uh, projecting uh, obedience to Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala, uh, God uh, the divine. I hope this was helpful and I hope you guys are doing very well uh, in your Ramadan. This Ramadan has already, you know, gone, this is going really, really fast. So now, you know, one sixth of Ramadan is is gone. Um, keep up the uh, the good energy and keep up the good work, inshallah. And uh, I will see you in the next episode. Let me know if you have any questions. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, please pray for me in this uh, holy month um, and pray for my family and pray for all the uh, uh, all the Muslims and all the nations. Pray for the peace in, uh, in this world. Um, there's a lot of people that are struggling in this world. Uh, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be... Um, uh, to basically save uh, uh, save us uh, in this month and to uh, protect us and to accept from us the good deeds. Um, Allahumma ameen. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.